Welcome, everyone. My name is Matt Bach. I'm the director of the triathlon business at UCAN, and my very special guest today is Dr. Paul Larson. Welcome, Paul. Hey, how are you, Matt? Great. So Paul is a unique person in our sport. I'm really excited to have him on because he's he works in on both the theory and the application. I mean, you don't find too many people who are, say, researchers, but at the same time are also athletes themselves and coaches who are working in the practice of the sport. So he's, he's an elite triathlon coach. He's an athlete himself. Uh, but on the other hand, he's a researcher and a professor. Um, so I'm really excited to have both, you know, both those perspectives in one person on the show today uh, talking us to, to us about how he fuels for triathlon and how his athletes uh, fuel for triathlon. So there'll be plenty of tips and tricks and things you'll learn about how you might improve your own nutrition and how you might fuel your, your own triathlons. So, Paul, uh, how, did, how did you get started in sport? How did you get started in triathlon? Yeah, well, thank you, Matt. It's great to be here. Um, thanks, for everyone, for tuning in and listening. Um, so, I guess I, I really, I'll, I'll, I'll fire through a couple slides to just describe the story a little bit. But uh, as my uh, good colleague, Martin Bichette, and I often say that we are classic semi-pro. So, I, I really started as a semi-pro found a, a love for triathlon uh, and I guess in the oh, late 80s, early 90s, had that dream. I think it was like Dave Scott, Mark Allen, the, the Iron War really inspired me to, uh, to become a triathlete. And I, you know, I did my first triathlon, I think, um, uh, first Ironman triathlon when I was 19, which was a, a big thing back in the day. And then I really had, you know, had dreams to replicate an Iron War um, and then also to be in the Olympics. And that didn't happen, but, you know, had learned lots along the way. And as a lot of us say, what, what, what happens when you, um, you know, you don't realize your, um, you know, your, your lifelong dream to become pro and you're still a semi-pro? Well, you, you turn to sports science and that's what I did. So I, uh, I'm from Vancouver and uh, I, I guess I, I did my, my master's, bachelor's and master's at the University of British Columbia, really doing research into trying to understand Ironman triathlon performance because the frustration of not being able to perform at the highest level for a long time, you know, really, uh, you know, it, it bothered me. So I had to, I had to figure out why that was the case. And that's really what I've I studied a, a solid four years in, in that area. I, 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 um, I got a scholarship to the University of Queensland down to Australia and I did three years my my uh, my doctoral thesis there on high intensity interval training, and uh, I've developed a bit of an expertise in that. You can listen to the you can sen seminar on high intensity interval training if you're interested in that topic. Uh, I stayed down in Australia for a, a solid uh, nine years, worked with the Australian Institute of Sport, went over to Perth at Edith Cowan University, and did a lot of research there on heat and and hydration, and um, that work got the my the attention of the New Zealand program and they they recruited me to lead uh, and develop a physiology team in a joint position with AUT University and high performance sport New Zealand the Olympic uh, organization that that um, supports their Olympic athletes so that was two Olympic cycles we're now you know almost 20 years away from from my homeland in Canada but I married a Canadian gal we had a little daughter and uh, it was time to move our family back and I'm Coming to you now from Revelstoke, British Columbia, Canada, where I, yeah, just I, I consult. I'm still an adjunct professor with AUT University, and I also coach uh, a lot of uh, very solid uh, triathletes, uh, mostly Ironman triathletes. So that is really the history, a, lot, a long history of understanding sport and exercise science, and like Matt said, also applying that that knowledge uh, at the coal face to to my athletes. So um, yeah, that's, that's yeah, I, I, I love maps. So this is really cool to look at, and I just uh, again astonished that you were 19 years old doing an Ironman. That's obviously quite young um, and <laughs> an amazing athlete yourself. So to tell me more about, you know, what what did you achieve when you were in triathlon then, and then, uh, you know, how how have you kind of used some of what you've learned? I think you know, in speaking with you is kind of cool how you've been able to apply what you've learned through your research and through your application and athletes that you've worked with. Maybe uh, just touch quickly on how that's kind of improved your own performances? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, that was part of the whole, uh, you know, the 20 year journey almost to uh, to try to figure out how to solve my own programming puzzle, as, as I like to say. And a lot of it 
was fuel-based. It was, was what I was eating that was really sabotaging my performance. There was, and I'm going to speak about this more throughout the presentation, but and I, I'm sure a lot of the listeners will appreciate that. There's been a lot, throughout the years, there has been a very large uh, body of research, and I've contributed to this and, and, found, uh, and also purported this at various times, that support a that, that we need to run on a uh, predominantly a carbohydrate-based metabolism. And I was notorious for smashing my carbs. And, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, I, I, this is just gross to think I did this. And I, uh, but I would, you know, I, I could drink two liters of Coke a day training when I was training, you know, big, big, big volumes. And it was just, it was awful to think I was putting that in my body when I think about it now and just all the sabotage that I was doing. But uh, ultimately, I was the biggest bonker in the world, and I was just, just really um, not, uh, just absolutely. I'd, I'd fly out, have, have an amazing, you know, swim and bike, and then I would just crash and burn on that run, and uh, could never crack a ten-hour Ironman, even though That's I was. You know, I think I hear that. You know, story I should have the, I should have had the, the 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 ability to do that, but I. Uh, I never, never could do that until the, you know, I'm getting to the end, it's getting to the punchline already, but until I went down this journey, uh, you know, and with, uh, you know, um, I, I don't know, um, uh, lead, leading from Dr. Volek and, and Dr. Noakes and switching my fuel metabolism through diet and then and training at the same time. And, you know, I, lo and behold, I finally cracked my 10 hour Ironman when I was 42, I think, you know, and I should have been able to do that. And probably, you know, done a lot better, more, you know, closer, closer towards your times, not if I had done that when I was a younger, uh, had a more potential powerful engine. So learn from my mistakes, team that's out there. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> took, took, took a long time, all of this schooling and all that research to figure it out. But uh, maybe if you had lived in a, a different day and, you know, had been born in a different time, maybe uh, the, the research would have advanced maybe to a point where maybe you wouldn't have had to do all the research and come to all these, you know, take all this extra time to get there. You would have been maybe uh, in your twenties or thirties uh, um, learning about all this approach and, and racing really fast. Yeah. Timing's everything. And I, I, I truly believe that, Matt, but it's, but it is what it is. And um, again, that's uh, it's my little journey in the world. It's time to, time to show others. And that's, that's what we should do here today. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it's a perfect segue into, you know, you've, you've kind of alluded to it or mentioned it on a couple of occasions here already, but, you know, these diet changes. So how did you, how did you fix those issues for yourself? And what have you done in the research space to, uh, and with your athletes to, to improve nutrition uh, and, and it reduce the chances of bonking and increase performances and improve performances uh, through a low carb, high fat diet? Yeah. So let's, um, I'm going to steal some slides from Dr. Volek, if that's all right. And really, um, you know, he's he's presented a lot of this before, but this is really what we're talking about is we're talking about here's here's Paul in the early days who's really um, fully um, using a carb based metabolism. Right. So he's he's chugging two liters of Coke a day. He's um, he's totally, uh, you know, he's pasta drinking, you know, eating pasta and rice and and really, you know, carb loading at every uh, opportunity. And now we've realized we advance uh, 10 to 20 years and we realize that there are a, far, a lot more opportunities, I think, especially in the context of a, of a triathlete, a long distance triathlete, for a, um, to switch to a fat-based metabolism, right? And the big thing that, that does this, like, so certainly training, training can allow us to um, push the fat-based metabolism more. That's why we do it, but we can we certainly get a large, a lot more bang for buck. And, you know, as I think uh, Jeff and, and Tim say, you, know, you can outrun a bad diet. And I believe that that was my problem. I was trying to outrun a bad diet. It just wasn't working for me. And, and um, so we need to, um, you know, that, that uh, well-formulated low carbohydrate, high fat diet is, is certainly where we want to go. And when you do that and go down that journey, there are better health performance and recovery opportunities. All right. So on the one hand, I was going towards the type two diabetic and metabolic syndrome. And I literally, I, I figured this out when I was in my late thirties and I was 
uh, going more towards this this problem of um, you know I, I was developing what we call over fat syndrome so I was developing um, I guess a li little bit more fat around my visceral organs which we don't want and this is from a guy who you know uh, is a former Ironman triathlete etc and but at that time um, you, were, you were still fit though right like you weren't you weren't for you know, sure obese or anything right but you had these these markers of of ill health that's right. So high blood pressure, um, uh, a gut uh, forming, um, you know, almost 10, 10 kilograms of body weight or you know, almost you know, 15, 15 uh, pounds or, or more around my, my midriff uh, predominantly and training like it's still training. And I, I'm sure, Matt, that you see uh, many individuals like this when you attend these you know, various endurance events. Uh, these are fit individuals, but th but they ha are clearly carrying more body fat on them than they need to right there and mm -hmm. and I, I i'm sure you've seen it because i see it all the time it's very oh, yeah. clear so um but it doesn't have to be that way should the if you can switch over and um so sort of follow that well formulated um low, low high fat low carbohydrate diet and you know again we want to move more towards this um i guess the world-class athlete um sort of uh um area or um yeah you know because it gives us a lot more opportunity so again we know that if we go back towards the guidelines and again this is what i was promoting in my you know i was giving lectures to, uh, at universities to uh you know 300 plus first and second year students and um you know we should be having you know carbohydrate recommendations for athletes should range from six to ten grams per kilogram body weight and um, yeah, you know, uh, carb, carb, because the carbs maintain that blood glucose levels for exercise and they're replacing the muscle glycogen, all right? This is in the American College of Sports Medicine um, joint position stand with American Dietetic Association and the Dietetics um, of Canada Association. So yeah, like, I mean, this is, this is what we promote. And um, you know, Gatorade Sports Science Institute, uh, that that are of course um, a, uh, a marketing arm of the Gatorade uh, Corporation, Quaker Oats. They are, you know, they're pushing this as well, and they they're the pr predominant. Um, I think they're the platinum sponsors of the American College of Sports Medicine. So the and they there's a great scientific body of evidence that can be used to. Um, support what they're what they're stating uh however things are things are definitely changing and there's things that are um i guess uh you know providing evidence that are counter to to these recommendations um just to finish on this we can see there's there, again there's predominant or there's um uh you know high uh very intelligent um individuals that are um rec making recommendations that we need to have these carbohydrates. They are they're um, the only fuel that we can use at, at very high exercise intensities. And whilst you know things like the marathon, road cycling, etc., uh, and all the the um, uh, I guess the events in the Olympics, because they are you they are competed at high exercise intensities, and they are we you know um, they use predominantly carbohydrate. That we should uh, match the diet accordingly. Now, um, there's some, um, I, again, I can understand the argument. However, what it's forgetting is the fact that when we fully, when we take a month or more to adapt to the high fat, low carbohydrate diet, uh, carbohydrates become produced anyways by, uh, through gluconeogenesis. The, the liver provides us basically with everything that we need. As I mentioned before, I, you know, I even invented an app to make the recommendations on the amount of carbohydrates that we need. And, you know, this is this was based on the um, uh, multiple transportable carbohydrate hypotheses and a lot of Asker Jukendrup's work. And again, this is me prior to one of the, my one of my many Ironmans. I think I've done 17 of these things. So here me here's me carbo loading, just a classic picture. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, I've, I've <laughs> I was still another crash and burn Ironman. But yeah, like I I I've been there just to just to be very clear. But it wasn't until I I guess it was following Tim Noakes and uh, and Jeff Jeff Follett's work, Stephen Finney, 
And uh, yeah, my, I, I really love the real meal revolution. So we'll get to some practical applications later, but this is my favorite is, uh, is Tim's real meal revolution, specifically his green list for, for eating um, in the low carb approach. And that's what I use. And that's what I use for a lot, a lot of my athletes to, to switch their, uh, I guess, learn their, their fuel to more a fat based approach. So lowering their, their insulin levels. And when I finally, when I, you know, that's what I, that's what happened when I when I finally did it I finally got my 10 hours you can just see how happy I am I'm 42 years <laughs> I love <of> age. that picture <laughs> it's a great photo eh? like it's yeah I think it was it was Europe triathlon they loved it so much they posted it on their magazine like I clipped it from it but that's at the New Zealand Ironman and that's a hard so if you know your Ironmans around the world New Zealand New Zealand Ironman is a hard one in Taupo to get a good time so it was a you know I think it was a top 50 placing and it was uh, yeah, it was really it was a good performance and I was uh, one of Oh, I'm forever proud of. So um, yeah, it was really, and but and that was based on the the fat, uh, the switch to the fat, um, the fat based diet. And again, at, done at 42, not not at, you know, not in my early 30s or late 20s when I when I should have easily been able to hit that. So what one question I've got is, have your biomarkers improved now that you've switched over? Yeah, fully have. Yeah, so the my, I guess my my main biomarker is my blood pressure is lowered, my uh, you know and it's it's sitting down as like a you know twenty something kind of blood pressure you know sitting around you know one ten over 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 seventy, and um, you know stable blood glucose, um, you know perfect perfect cholesterols and and uh, triglycerides and yeah so all that sort of stuff just naturally happens eventually so. Yeah, and awesome. and again, the the mental performance. As a lot of people sort of say, it's the absolute major benefit. That's that's definitely improved from the whole thing too. Yeah. So yeah, let's just I guess describe a little bit more about why this would be the case. Why why an benefit would uh, why an athlete would would benefit here. And I love this analogy of the um, the fact that you know we have and and this was from Jeff again. We've kind of stolen that through. We modified his his slides here a little bit, but you know our fat stores in our body are just for for argument's sakes they are they're infinite, right? If you wanted to, um, you know, we have the potential to probably do you know go from coast to coast, from Pacific to Atl um, to Atlantic Ocean um, and walking across it. If you abs if you had a gun to your head, most of us have enough fat stores on our in our body to be able to uh, to be able to do that, right? So so much energy within there. Conversely, we've we've only got enough, you know, um, energy within stored within our uh, skeletal muscles and our uh, liver to, you know, run a marathon, and that's what the that's what the what happens with the bonking. So we want to ultimately, you can see this little connector that we've created between our fat stores and our, um, I guess, our engine here. We don't just want to run that with um, with our, our finite glucose stores in the engine here, we want to be able to tap into the to the big truck. We don't just want to use what's in the the gas tank or the uh, you know the the diesel tank of our of our truck and trailer. We want to tap right back into the whole thing. I think that's what Jeff was saying. With this, is that isn't it ironic that uh you know you can be you can have all this this energy store in your in your system, but you can actually break down on the highway and run out of gas. Well, yeah, so we want to tie that in. How do you tie that in? You become fat adapted. You lower your insulin levels and uh, improve your, you, you develop metabolic flexibility. So, so yeah. I've, I've, I've experienced exactly what you're talking about too. That was definitely a component of my story. I mean, I've done uh, my first four Ironmans I did using that conventional approach. And then I flipped the switch for me and I haven't had any GI distress or any bonking issues since switching over to a fat burning approach uh, and using UCAN. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's just it. I mean, we're, so this is just the fuel um, uh, aspect, but you're, you're spot on. That's probably the number one reason why the um, athletes actually, uh, pro athletes especially will approach me is because they are, um, they're getting, you know, they're doing these performances and they are coming down to the last, uh, you know, they're on like 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour uh, using the multiple uh, transportable carbohydrate gels and they're cranking in the carbs because they're carb-based athletes. And the 
the biggest thing that's getting them is not their physical ability or um but it's it's really the the fact that their gut is uh, is letting them down and they're bloating and there's so much pain within their gut that they um they're actually having to walk because the pain is the pain in their gut is actually debilitating them so that's that's cause and that, again that's because there's so much um sugar and um, I guess, uh, um, fermenting carbohydrates that are basically in there and they're fermenting and they're creating gas and they're causing that, that, um, that stomach bloating. And you can see this even on the lava fields when you go out to Kona or any Ironman, you can just see the people that just, they're holding their guts, they're distended and it's, it's not a pretty sight. So that is, you know, even Death March in the last 10 miles of the most Ironman marathons, you see so many people walking. Oh, I know. And it's not necessarily because of fitness. I think so much of it is because of these GI distress issues and these bonking issues. Exactly. So, yeah, that's this is a, just a, another entirely different topic. But, but even the fueling is is really cool too, right? So we have we want to tap into that fat fat based approach. We get, uh, I guess, you know, we can use a lot more more fuels. It's more efficient. So now you don't have to take in as much carbohydrates because you can run in a lower tank. Uh, in turn, and because your your fat, uh, you, you develop the metabolic flexibility, and you're 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 reaching right into that fat tank, and you're you're taking that fuel out, and then you're relying less on the the gels and and other products, and you don't have to have as much in your gut, and your gut's clean, and it's not uh, distended, and lo and behold, you can run the first, you can run the the last 10k of your marathon the same way you ran your first 10k of the of Ironman marathon. It's pretty pretty exciting when athletes do that and they, they can learn to do that. So yeah, and that metabolic flexibility is so key. Yeah. And then uh, again, here we, here we have the liver and the liver is a key player in this whole thing. It's really uh, allowing for this fat based metabolism with the big one here, the, um, these big energetic things that come out, the liver produces ketones and you've probably heard of uh, ketone based metabolism. And these are highly efficient, uh, um, another substrate that really, um, you can turn that on, you're going to get way more bang for buck of ATP relative to an ener energy substrate. Pretty cool. Yeah, so this is, and, and again, if we go to Asker Jukendrup's work, the, the argument, and again, let's look at the argument for staying carb-based, and it's just that, according to Asker here, and, and some of his work, fat oxidation drops close to zero at high intensities. Unfortunately, what's forgotten in here is this is all, and again, this gets a little technical, and but basically, um, there's there's a lot of incorrect assumptions for bringing this down to zero. It should not be happening actually, because when you um, when you breathe out carb carbon dioxide and uh, at very uh, high exercise intensities, you're, it's actually due to the fact that um, we've got um, the baking soda. Sodium bicarb, and that is that's sitting within your bloodstream. It's one of our key blood buffers. When that acid, that blood lactic acid, um, floods into, or at least the hydrogen ion floods into the to the um, to the bloodstream, it's immediately met. Its job is to be met by the by the bar, bicarbonate that's floating around in your bloodstream, and that's and and what the the resultant is more carbon dioxide, and that goes into this little. Uh, tool here that we use to measure the substrate and outpours all this carbon dioxide and through the calculation of how much carbohydrate and fat you get it's skewing the relationship and it's telling us that we're burning uh, lots of carbs when in actual fact we're not we're actually it, it's it's nullifying the calculation so loads of incorrect uh, assumptions within us sports science scientists so it's um it's a bit of a fallacy there's a, a slight Increase in carb in in carb oxidation at higher exercise intensities, but it's by no means zero. Right? And we showed this, and and this is one of the studies that I've done. Done. Um, this is with uh, with Stephen Sealer and and the late uh, Ken Headlett. And um, what these guys did is they took. Uh, well, basically, when we start. We can just see here that within this group of I guess, recreationally trained and well-trained runners, we see a, a strong relationship between the level of VO2 max and the fat oxidation. Higher fat oxidations were associated with higher VO2 max. At high, so, and this is in a, a study where we have recreationally trained and well-trained athletes performing uh, ultimately a, an interval training um, test, we can call it. 
carbohydrate oxidation at high intensities, an unclear to negative relationship. In other words, the higher the VO2 max, the lower the, the carbohydrate oxidation. This is exactly the opposite that we would expect to find uh, according to the fact that carbs are important at high exercise intensities. So again, this, is the, this was the study. It was titled Rethinking the Role of Fat Oxidation. Right? And basically, we took a group of uh, just recreationally trained runners, training, say, three times per week. We compared the, that to a group of well-trained uh, orienteers training uh, you know, 10 sessions a week. And these guys are running 15 kilometers an hour um, you know, up a, in their interval session six by four minutes, five, up a 5% incline with two, two minutes recovery between. And they are, um, you know, these are the guys that are burning more fat at high exercise intensity versus these guys, all right? So you want to be able to burn loads and loads of fat at high exercise intensities, um, not, those, not carbohydrate. Those well-trained runners, were they trying like to make changes in their diets as well to make themselves burn fat better? Or were they just because of, you know, they just kind of maybe happened upon or like coincidentally became better at fat burning because, partly because of their training, but maybe they just happened to make those changes in their, in their diets too. Like how did that happen? Do you think? Um, I think it's, it's largely a function of the, uh, just the training, like the training itself. So if you're, and remember I said to start, we, you, there's two sort of ways or there's two key factors. One is your diet. The other one is the actual exercise training. So these guys are training 10, 10 times a week versus these guys probably three times a week and three to four times a week in their running. It's yeah, it's mostly the training. The you know the the diet is was was just pretty standards. And these were um, I believe this was the you know Norwegian uh, individual Norwegian population. So who have a generally large a lar uh, you know maybe a larger fat in their diet than the typical American diet, but for the you know for argument's sakes is mostly the training that's that's really creating this and even these fat oxidation rates they're not that big but the, i guess the key findings were that both the the well trained and recreationally trained athletes performed their interval trainings all right uh with similar levels of rating perceived exertion all right in that in that session similar levels of blood lactate and carbohydrate oxidation but the well trained runners oxidized nearly three times more fat and the recreationally trained athletes during the high intensity uh, uh, interval training itself. And the greater capacity to perform the high intensity intermittent work was mostly explained by the higher fat oxidation rates in the well-trained runners, not the carbohydrate amount that the, um, that the individuals were, um, uh, you know, that that's often gets purported as being critical to, um, to performing. So um, performing high intensity work. So is, is, uh, I guess this, fly, this study flies in the face of conventional uh, recommendations. Yeah, so again, you know, we, we think that uh, this, is, this is generally the, um, yeah, I guess I was gonna talk next here about uh, Jeff Volek's work a little bit. And uh, this, is, this was his faster study. And this is where he took a group of, this is long-term adap adaptations, or long-term, uh, yeah, long-term adjustments within a group of uh, low-carb, high-fat athletes and a group of, you know, uh, that were on the standard um, high-carbohydrate diet. And we can just see the, these are the two groups here that he had. Basically, no, no difference in the two groups, 10 in each group before they start. Um, completely opposite diets, so... 70% fat in the low carb group, 60% carbs in the high carb group, pretty much similar proteins, a little bit more in the low carb group. And in his faster study, we're basically doing uh, a VO2 max test and then a treadmill run for three hours in these ultra guys at 65% of VO2 max to determine their fuel use. And then loads and loads of tests you can see in their blood muscle uh, et cetera, to, to determine the, um, just how these individuals under long-term adaptation um, function and uh, to, to do their activity. And again, as we'd probably expect, the, when, when they shifted their diet, we had a, a very, uh, way more fat oxidation. Look at those peak fat oxidation rates on an average, up, you know, around 1.54 um, grams of fat 
per minute um, versus the high carb athletes. And these are athletes as well, um, up around you know, 0.67 uh, grams of fat per minute. So way more, you know, larger capacity. Again, remember the same thing, the consensus view is that at these high exercise intensities, you can't burn any fat, it's, it goes to zero. But again, that's just not the case here. What, what uh, Jeff and his colleagues found in the FASTER study, if you're on a lo uh, low carb diet, you're, um, you know, you're gonna be able to burn way more fat at high exercise intensities. And uh, again, you're gonna be sparing that critical muscle glycogen for the high intensity work. The dotted lines here again, that re those are reflective of that bicarb, sodium bicarb that I mentioned there before. So, I mean, that, that all jives with my own experience with becoming a better fat burner. I uh, took a metabolic efficiency test on a, like a, a metabolic test on a, one of those carts, the um, like the, the Parvo carts and um, on a treadmill. So I was hooked up to the mask like you showed there and I, I was oxidizing. Um, uh, my fat oxidation was 40% of my, you know, 40% of my energy was coming from fat at Ironman target race pace, uh, which is like 6:45 pace at the time. And then five weeks later, I made some changes in my diet, and uh, and I had 60% of my, 60% um, uh, of my energy was coming from fat uh, after just five weeks. So there was it was a pretty huge shift, and and that was at um, a fairly high intensity. Um, I mean, not not too high of an intensity, but I, I've also done the uh, the tests where the you know it ramps up in intensity, and as I get up up to those higher intensities, even higher, like 80, 90 percent, like you showed in that chart before, uh, I found that I was still burning a pretty large amount of fat. Yeah. So and and again again perfect slide to have up there as you describe your your journey, Matt, because you ultimately started in the high carb camp, and you were you know you were forced to burn quite a bit of your muscle glycogen and liver stores because you, were, um, you weren't burning as much fat at that point in time. You shifted your diet and you, you, know, you were looking a little bit more like these guys with the low carb diet guys. And think of how much more carbohydrate now you get to spare and hold on to um, for later on during in, in the race. You know, again, you've, you've, um, you've tapped into your, your um, you know, the, the resource that you're carrying around in your fat stores and you're able to, um, yeah, perform way, way longer and, um, you know, reserve these high car these carbohydrate stores for when they're needed, when you really need to kind of kick into gear. So, yeah. And again, that's really what, what Jeff in the faster study was showing. So same sort of thing here. You want to, you know, if, if, if you can, it's, it's very advantageous to shift yourself into that, you know, those higher fat oxidation rates. Um, and I, I think probably one of the, the, the striking uh, findings in this study to me were, were, were some of these ones here, uh, that these, these slides here. And I, and I recognize these will be a little bit um, you know, complex for, for, some, for some individuals. But the first one is, uh, I'll, just, I'll just note is the one we mentioned before, and that's the ketones. Look, no, remember the ketones, those are those high energy substrates that your, uh, your liver is producing out of, the, out of fat, out of uh, triglycerides those are way higher than in the high carb athlete. Um, so again, these are brain fuel. These are more efficient substrate for all your other muscles. Um, notice the glucose level is probably um, about the same. So, you know, for, you know, there's no hypoglycemia that's going on here in these, in these individuals, right? So here's the low carb group. They're actually at a higher um, blood glucose level. And that's just, again, all being dictated by that, that liver. Um, notice the, the key one here, we'll talk about insulin in a bit, but the insulin level much, much lower throughout the, uh, these individuals. And again, well, you know, in, with reference to you can, we can, we're going to see similar things here later on down the road with, uh, the, the you can's helping to facilitate the, the lower insulin levels. Uh, lactate's a fascinating one. And again, this is, is something that's probably going on within the muscle cells themselves and possibly the liver, but lactate is a great little fuel as well. Uh, we're, we're discovering as it almost parallels the, the sort of the ketones and it can be a, another really great fuel. Uh, so there's almost like this trade off, this, this trading that's going on between the muscle and the liver to facilitate these, the energy that's needed. Um, and on and on it kind of goes. So it's 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 a, a, fa a fascinating new um, phase of understanding metabolism for the low carb athlete. But in in general, it's all sort of favorable 
this is the one that kind of excites me the most is the ketones. And this one, this is absolutely um, blew everyone away. And there's so many that don't even believe this data, unfortunately, from maybe the other camp that, but this is the muscle glycogen. Again, you think about it, you will, if you're in low, if you have a low um, carbohydrate amount in your diet, say you're sitting around, you know, between 50 and 100 grams per day, and you're constantly training, you would, everyone says, well, you're going to be low in your muscle glycogen. Your muscle glycogen is going to be low and you're going to be absolutely screwed for high exercise intensity. But have a look here, folks. Like mm -hmm. here's, here's that baseline in the low carb and the high, high carb group. Not a, not a difference. Um, this is uh, after the, um, after the, the three hour uh, long run. Um, again, not a, not a difference. Uh, you know, difference from baseline, but no difference between the high carb and the low carb group. And then right back after, this is the, the low carb group is having low carbs uh, recovery um, uh, food. And again, nothing, no, no sort of difference. So the body's figuring itself out um, and, and it's basically converting all those, the fat components and the protein components back into the carbs that are needed. But it's, there's no, um, there's no necessity or need for carbo, you know, certain, uh, you know, large boluses of carbohydrate thereafter. So pretty cool. Uh, and again, the big one that's, that's so key in facilitating some of these adaptations that we want is the insulin response that we get in the low carb group versus the high carb group. This is just an, an insulin resistance sort of score. So this is um, these these individuals. This was this was me before. I would have been more in the you know I would have been not insulin sensitive before. I would have been insulin resist you know insulin resistant, and again uh, you know moving more towards later on uh, after I became fat adapted, um, you know, definitely developing a, a healthier phenotype and as a low carb athlete and and more insulin sensitive. So yeah, we, and this is a, again a very uh, busy little graph, but it just uh, and from you know Jeff, Tim, and and Stephen, who are really just showing all the various different benefits. We've spoken on on many of these throughout the entire uh, webinar, but yeah, like the the beta hydroxy uh, butyrate um, signaling and the fuel source itself, uh, it, causing all of these various different benefits from lowered fatigue, better cognitive functioning. Um, you know, gut health, we, Matt spoke about, uh, all these various different things for improved recovery, health, and longevity, and on and on it goes. So yeah, I don't know, if it's any further questions there, Matt, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll move into some practical stuff a little bit after. Yeah, I mean, that's all fascinating stuff. I've, I've uh, been somewhat familiar with all of these studies through my conversations with my own sports nutritionist and through my own just research and, you know, listening to podcasts and things like that. But uh, I've never really dived so deep into it and been able to, to kind of, um, you know, see all these different charts and have them explained to me. So that was, that was really cool. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. So yeah, I guess uh, this is really where a lot of people want to go and they, they, you know, they're, they'll say well that's great thanks very much for all the, the scientific work but let's let's get into some practical sites so if I want to do this how can I go about my my game of of trying to um, you know become fat adapted and and again I think it really comes down to that um, you, you take your pick there's so many that are out there that are you're going to be able to use to um, you know, books and stuff to be able to become fat adapted, but you want to develop that um, well-formulated ketogenic diet. So Jeff Volick and Stephen Finney have a great book, right? Their classic one. You could use that. Again, as mentioned, my personal preference, I really like um, Tim Noakes's uh, Real Meal Revolution. That's usually the one I, I hand over the manual to my, to my athletes when they start up and I'm telling them, you know, eat from the green list, avoid the, uh, Avoid the red and amber ones as best you can, and um, and and it takes a long a, you know a long period of time to go through that process and and become fat adapted, right? So that's the sort of the first thing that that we that that we want to do. Um, give yourself a month to go through the whole thing. Really, uh, you know, a couple tools you can get are uh, you know um, a blood uh, ketone and blood glucose meter, and you can monitor these in the morning. 
and you can be, um, you know, you, you want to have a sort of a, you really want to bring that uh, basal blood glucose um, marker down, uh, you know, sitting around five millimoles. Uh, I think it's uh, that is around, um, I'm blanking, I think it's about 90 uh, is that gram, um, milligrams per, uh, I've, I've forgotten the other one, I'm, I always work in the millimoles. Um, so pardon me there. Uh, and then the other thing you really want to measure too is your is your blood ketone levels, right? So you get your uh, your ketones and you slowly want to bring those ones up to when you're you know if you're carb adapted, you'll those will be sitting down around the 0 0.1 0 0.2, but as you become more fat adapted, those will be drifting up more towards the 0 0.5 0 0.7 and and up up over one. And and that's a yeah that's a really good sign that you're becoming more fat adapted. Of course, so you you know if you really wanted to get fancy, you could find a um, a laboratory like some of the photos and stuff we're showing. But for you know for simplicity, things that uh, you can use are your you know the the blood ketone level and really also one of the key ones is how are you feeling on a long ride. So you go out for your long ride and. You know, do you do you need to? Um, you're super hungry, right? And I, I don't know if you're if you're like me, Matt. But when I started out with these long rides, I would have to fuel with gels when it you know, probably from like an hour, from an hour, hour and a half. I've got to be got to be pouring down some uh, some gels, and and I can't wait for my muffin stop at the coffee shop. So <laughs> the more fat adapted you become, the less you're reliant on the, these sorts of things, right? Um, so yeah. these these are the sort of the first steps. Yeah, I'd be fueling frequently and early on into the ride, I'd be having my peanut butter and jellies before the ride, and then yeah, like an hour in, I'd be slamming down gels and stuff. And then once it becomes more fat adapted, I noticed a, a remarkable change, even just within a, a handful of weeks, that I felt like I just didn't need nearly as much. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's that's where you kind of want to get to. Now, here's the other thing that uh, has be kind of become uh, apparent within the uh, within the literature, and that's you know, is a little bit you almost kind of want to fuel for the work that's required is what uh, what what people are saying. And with high intensity work, no question that there is a a, a greater carbohydrate draw. You're you're dipping in, you're using those muscle glycogen stores more. And you also there, you know, there's another argument you could be made that you want to prepare for, uh, you know, your events. And there's some level of adaptation that may occur from from the gut. You don't want to commit, potentially completely eliminate uh, carbohydrate and carbohydrate absorption. Um, so this is where, again, for my athletes for high intensity sessions, we're recommending we use the source of fuel that we're going to use for the event. And um, we're loading high intensity sessions with carbohydrate. Okay, so again, in the context of the UCAN, if, we're, if I'm prescribing a high intensity exercise or a high intensity interval training workout, and again, if you want to hear about some of those, go to the, the Generation UCAN webinar that that um, that was just previously done on the on the hit. And yeah, the, we're, it's it's really good to be able to use a carbohydrate source for those. Uh, those types of workouts. Now, carbohydrate is a, uh, a central nervous system stimulator. It's a, it stimulate your, it engages the sympathetic nervous system and gives you a little bit more bang for buck. You know, you you dip into your high intensity work a little bit more when carbs are present, when they're you know they're through the um, uh, in, and they're going into the sort of the system and there's this feeling like energy is coming in. Well, that's that's uh, again a a little bit of a trick that we can use for digging a little bit deeper on these high intensity sessions. All right. And the advantage again of the UCAN is as we're going to go into here to next is that you don't get the big whopping insulin response too. And that was really from this study here. Um, this was a study by Roberts and colleagues. Uh, you can see Jeff Volok an author on that paper as well. And in this study, they really compared uh, a classic carbohydrate approach to a long cycling bout and in recovery with the um, with the UCAN product, right? They, so you can see it here, modified maxi ways starch. That's the that's what's in the UCAN. And you can see here that the you just have a look at the blood glucose when they started to take this. 
spikes up in the normal, um, you know, the, the classic uh, carbohydrate with sugar. And you can see with the um, with the Generation U can, where it's a little bit more of a homeostatic or stable blood glucose level during the long the long cycling bout. And then same within the recovery. Again, you're having that after in the recovery phase. It's not a not a really you know spiking your blood glucose after. And again, the key regulator of everything that we need to pay attention to is our plasma insulin. Remember, insulin is the, the lock and key mechanism for either putting um, you know, basically it's, it's turning us into a storage factory. So we're either going to store our fat and carbohydrate, or we're going to allow, uh, you know, carbs and, and fat to come out to the system and be actually burned. So again, uh, this is a, the advantage of, of this, uh, this product here is to be able to lower that, that blood glucose. Now, one thing we will notice is that through these 15 minute interval time points, there comes a point during exercise when the exercise itself is, uh, you know, allowing us to just basically take in that sugar during, and you know we def that that is this is when almost the safety sort of period I think you could be having other products. So say you're getting and and this to me this is where my big recommendation for my athletes is this is a problem sector right here. Imagine your your event your your triathlon starts right here. I do not want this happening. Because if insulin is high prior to the event, I am going to be blocking my ability to get into my to my fat stores. I do not want that. So mm -hmm. this is the key time when I want my athletes to be sipping on UCAN. This is my big recommendation to them. Um, so they wake up in the morning, they have their low fat or sorry, low carbohydrate, high fat um, uh, meal, right? So a couple eggs, say for example, is 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 pretty classic, and that's going to just you know give you the aminos that you need for the day and keep your, uh, keep your, you know, um, you know, keep the carbohydrate levels low and the insulin level low. And then also on the way, practically speaking, have a, have a, um, sip on the, you can sip on the, on the waxy maize starch throughout the, uh, prior to the, um, to the event. And then when you're on the bike, that first bottle to me is, is critical. And that's what, you know, my guys are using, they're using, yeah, a bottle uh, or two of you can. That's the prep one. That's the one that I'm placing in the bike cages in that initial phase. And then once you're on course, don't stress about it too much, uh, you know, because there's really, you know, there's only so much you can do. But the beautiful thing is, is that during during that exercise, when your muscles are moving, when they're uh, they're just going to be taking on that fuel. And it's, you know, if you need to grab a gel or a um, any of the product that, that's on the course, wherever you go, it's not a big a deal. But again, if you've um, used the UCAN before, you're, you're going to be really sweet and you're going to be maximizing that performance. So yeah, those are um, yeah my, my key little recommendations for an actual, um, I guess, uh, fueling during an event itself. And maybe, Matt, you want to tease out anything I might have missed there, mate? No, I mean, that's great. And it, so, uh, I mean, Many people find like I noticed you 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 spoke a lot about like kind of like before the the race and in the early stages of the race, really emphasizing how you can is important for staying in that fat burning mode, keeping those insulin levels stable so that you can tap into those fat stores. Um, and then at least in my case, like I noticed that even if I were to start taking those gels, like let's say on the bike, and you know when in that more muted insulin phase where uh, you're saying it's safe for me anyway I my, don't, my stomach just couldn't handle it all so I, I, I kept going with the you can until uh, about halfway through the run because the GI distress would end up hitting me if I had you know several gels later in the race um, for sure for sure and so that I, is the I, I think you know sort of everybody's got to be a little bit different there like for me I, I have some of the GI distress and more sensitive stomach so I, I you can throughout a longer portion of the race whereas somebody who has an iron stomach maybe they focus more on like you know, you can for the first third or half of the race, and then they and then they might switch over to to some other things that are on the course. What, yeah, what do you, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think that's I think you're spot on. But again, here's again we if we go back to our overarching principle that we that we when we sort of where we began with this, the key thing you can be doing is becoming fat adapted. Become fat adapted. Shift your shift to the to the phase where you don't need as much carbohydrate on the course. Mm -hmm. And now you can, you don't have to have as many gels as you had before. You're not, you're not having to aim for 
90 grams plus of carbohydrate an hour because you just don't need it. So you can take that burden off the GI system. And then if you have to smash one or two gels throughout that, you should not have as big a reaction, right? It's like it's um, take take the GI stress um, out of the system, but you know, acknowledging your 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 important point there, Matt, in that we are all individuals. We got to find out what works for for us. You've found that out yourself. Um, you you know, even you know, you might be sensitive to a single gel, and so people have to sort of know that. But the big one that the big thing that I've found is when people actually fat adapt, and they actually you know, if they usually they can handle one or two in kind of an emergency sort of thing. Like if that's the only thing that's out there and available. They're not going to be, uh, and they can't, for whatever reason, carry the you can throughout the whole thing. It's it's kind of it's okay, and they can relax a little bit more and just use sort of what what's ever on the course. But for me, my big one that is a no like is a uh, it's a must have a must do for my athletes is you can in that in that phase the first phase of the bike and uh, up to the start line. Um, so become fat adapted. You can to start. And then, um, yeah, and then I, I don't stress too, too much with my guys usually thereafter, especially mm-hmm. if they can't control it. Very cool. Yeah. So the approach is the same for them for, uh, you know, long course or, or like 70.3 or, or Ironman distance. Uh, you kind of use the same type of approach, you know, make sure you keep your blood sugar stable using you can before in the early stages and then uh, later in the race, letting them yeah. kind of do what, what they feel like they should do. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Same, same principles. You know, we're talking four versus eight hours. It's not too, too much difference um, in, in the big picture things in terms of the, the physiology that's actually happening. The, it's not that massively different that the principles that I've just mentioned would almost apply to, to either of those events. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned it earlier. I'm sure you, you wish you knew all this back when you were t- 19 years old doing oh, yeah. the first Ironman. <laughs> I sure, I sure do. Yeah, because then, then you're blessed with like the larger, you know, the larger engine, right? The you know the higher VO2 max, right? So you've got greater kind of capacity and and you know yeah. So then you can you can develop your sort of yourself a little bit better. But ah, that's that's life. I was happy to happy to finally get under 10 hours when I uh, when I when I did at least uh, at least I did it eventually. <laughs> but I had, turns into a good story of, of learning along the way which which is you know with uh w- which is with all of us so we're all in a, we're all on a journey of learning so uh if if you want to give you can a try uh we got a special offer for those listening uh fueling with prof is uh, a code that you can use on our website for 15 percent off um anything else uh you'd, you'd like to share before we close out dr paul no, no, I just, uh, yeah, again, I, I encourage all the listeners to, to get out there, experiment, find out what works for them, just as Matt sort of was saying. And uh, yeah, hopefully you found some of this, uh, this information useful and best of luck to everyone. Thank you. I mean, I, f- I found it fascinating and, and uh, you're an absolute wealth of information. Uh, there's, I learned a ton on here, even just, uh, you know, and I, and I had learned quite a bit about it in my journey, but this, I, there was so much more here that I, I didn't even know. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and I'm my sure our pleasure. listeners are, have drawn a lot from it as well. My pleasure, Matt. Cool. And yeah, have a great one. Yep. You too. Thank you.